Welcome to Coronavirus Impact. I'm Cass Baker. Our first guest today over the phone is John Mysick, Editor-in-Chief of the Pennsylvania Capital Star. John, thank you for joining us. Hi, Cass. So Governor Wolf has recently expanded his stay-at-home order. Which counties are included in that, and how many counties are we up to at this point? All told, there are 22 counties uh, included in the stay-at-home order. Tests, they are Allegheny, Beaver, Berks, Bucks, Butler, Center, Chester, Delaware, Erie, Lackawanna, Lancaster, Lehigh, Luzerne, Monroe, Montgomery, Northampton, Philadelphia, Pike, Washington, Wayne, Westmoreland, and York counties. Um, the newest order, which brought in Bieber, Butler, and Center, went into effect uh, at 8 p.m. on Saturday and will run until April the 6th. And why are these counties being included in this order? The administration said that it's trying to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 through Pennsylvania, which is now in 58 of 67 counties, Tess. Um, they said they've been trying to target those counties that are hotspots, those counties with uh, with growth in cases such as York and Philadelphia and all of the ones that I mentioned, that I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, rather than put the whole state under a stay-at-home order, they've been trying to sort of tamp down the hotspots in, in an attempt to contain the uh, the spread of the illness. And how long will this order be in place for these counties? As I said a moment ago, Tess, this will, this will be in effect until April the 6th. And do we see this order being expanded at all? That certainly seems to be the case. Um, every couple of days, the administration, has again, has expanded the number of counties. It's now about a third of all Pennsylvania counties, 22 of, uh, of 67. Uh, you know, at the moment, um, the, the virus is now ringing the greater Harrisburg area, so it's only a matter of time, I would suppose, before those orders are uh, before those orders are expanded. Um, and, the, and again, the administration is proceeding deliberately with this stuff, so there's no reason not to expect that, that more might not might, more might be added before this is done. So, when a county is placed under a stay-at-home order, what are citizens expected to do during that time? <laughs> Stay at home. That is the that is the bottom line on it. Um, they're allowed to leave to go grocery shopping, to go to work if they need to, to go to the doctor's office, to go to pick up prescription medication, uh, to get outside to exercise near their homes. But in general, they're expected to stay indoors at all times. What impact do you see this order having on the workforce and the economy here in Pennsylvania? Well, look, we've already, we already know that the governor has ordered all non-essential businesses to be closed. Um, thousands applied for waivers to that order. We know that... Um, you know, the Pennsylvania economy is already suffering. The nationwide economy is already suffering from this. Um, unemployment claims uh, went through the roof. We've seen record numbers, historic numbers of unemployment claims. Um, we still need to know what the impact is going to be on the state's bottom line. Uh, our colleagues at Spotlight PA reporting today that um, 2,500 state employees, uh, sort of part-time and seasonal workers and interns have been laid off as a consequence of the economic impact of the virus. Um, it's going to be wide, widespread and holistic, and I think it's going to take a, a, a bit of time before we finally come to terms with the full economic impact. But certainly it's been devastating from the beginning. Now, you mentioned Governor Wolf's closure of non-essential businesses. What happens if some of those businesses choose to stay open instead of closing? Uh, the state police have been going around and enforcing that order, uh, warning businesses to close. Uh, they can face citations or license revocations or fines or even criminal penalties. Um, the state police have been releasing a data count every day of the, uh, of the businesses that they've issued warnings to. Now, when we're talking about coronavirus infections in the state, how many, how many cases are we seeing? Okay, through, so, and let me pull up the latest numbers on that one uh, through midday Sunday. And again, this number will be updated shortly after we get off the telephone. Uh, there were 3,394 known cases in Pennsylvania, uh, sadly, with uh, 38 fatalities statewide. And out of our entire population, who is being most affected by this? So it's, a po it's the state with a population of uh, 13 million people, Cass. Um, they're just shy of 13 million um, and the initial thought was that it was those older Pennsylvanians, those aged 60 to 65 and older, um, were, the, were those who were most at risk. Uh, but we've since seen revised data out of the Department of Health showing that younger Pennsylvanians are, uh, in fact, at greater risk of infection uh, than our older Pennsylvanians. And 
when people are infected, how many of them are being tested? All right, so let me pull up the testing data on there. There have been 33,455 tests as of midday, um, again, as of midday Sunday that have been reported to the Department of Health. Um, and again, of those, 3,394 have tested positive. Is this enough testing? <laughs> I don't think there's anywhere near enough testing, but that is not for me to say. Certainly that um, you know, more, more people should be tested. The Department of Health is only get, trying to get people tested who are exhibiting symptoms. They've urged asymptomatic people to, uh, to stay at home and, again, to only seek testing if they're exhibiting symptoms. So what have your thoughts been so far on the governor and his administration's overall response to this outbreak? So, Cass, we've seen some new public opinion numbers on that uh, just this morning. We have that story on the Capital Star's website. Uh, nearly 7 in 10 Pennsylvanians with support uh, cutting across party lines, uh, saying they support the governor and his administration's handling of, uh, of the emergency, uh, uh, handling of the emergency, pardon me, this is from Oakland University and Ohio Northern University, a poll that came out um, over the weekend um, of voters in the four 2020 battleground states. That's Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and uh, Wisconsin. Um, they performed better than uh, Donald Trump and who got between 51 and 58 percent support in those four states. Um, and just watching from the sidelines and somebody who writes opinion for a living, I think I have generally been impressed with the governor's handling of this. Um, certainly, this has been a moment for state governors to step up and um, exhibit, le exhibit leadership. We've seen that in Governor Christo Christopher Cuomo of New York. Um, governor, uh, the, the Republican governor of Maryland has stepped up in a similar way. Um, it has really, I think, shown a divide in the way uh, states have handled this as compared to the federal government. How has that state response been different from the federal response from the president's administration? Well, I, you know, the, 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 often these things are done in concert. We saw that with, with Superstorm Super Storm Sandy some years ago, um, where FEMA came in and worked with the Republican governor of New Jersey. And there's been a lot of cooperation. Um, there has been a trend, um, and this has been across administrations and over the last 10 or 15 years, uh, to devolve more responsibilities to the states. And the Trump administration has been particularly big on this. You've seen the White House in briefings saying it's up to the governors to find supplies. It's up to the governors to find ventilators. The downside of that, Tess, is that states are now engaged in bidding wars um, for critical supplies when Washington should be serving as a clearinghouse for this kind of equipment. Um, so in a lot of ways, bad policy has come home to roost, and it's been up to governors to, to step up and to try to fill that gap as best they can. Now, this past Friday, Governor Wolf signed COVID-19 response legislation. What were in those bills and how will that affect Pennsylvanians? Okay, so there was uh, chief among those is, is one of them moved the April 28th primary date to June 2nd. Um, it's allowed for, it's allowed for uh, streamlined some of the use of mail-in balloting. So that's one of the more immediate effects. Provided some more money for unemployment compensation. It provided more money for Pennsylvania hospitals, a $50 million emergency fund. Uh, so those are three of the most immediate ways that Pennsylvanians will see effect from that. And last Wednesday on the federal level, uh, the U.S. Senate approved a $2, mil a $2 trillion spending bill. What is the status on that bill as of right now? So the president, that went to the House on Friday. The president signed into the law uh, a couple of hours later. Um, everyone Kess knows the top line headline for this. Most U.S. households uh, will receive a relief check uh, either electronically or in the post box uh, for $1,200. Some families will receive more, some families received less. Um, that's sort of the big takeaway. Again, there's more money in there for unemployment compensation, particularly for freelancers and part-time workers and gig workers. Uh, there's more money in there for hospital aid. It's the biggest stimulus package in American history. Uh, states and localities, I think, are lined up for... I want to say $5 billion in assistance. And um, as of Saturday, I think the governor's administration were still waiting to see what Pennsylvania's chunk of that money was going to be. John Mysick, thank you so much for your time today. Anytime. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back right after this. We have three branches of government, executive, legislative, and judicial. Voting is a civic duty. Voters are an integral part in government operations. When I run for office, you can be my campaign manager. 
Do you have a child curious about civic engagement? Support their passion with PCN Civics 101, a free online resource presented by the Pennsylvania Cable Network. Easy to watch videos take learners into the Capitol to see how our state government functions. Meant to enhance your child's classroom studies. Go to PCNTV.com to start watching. PCN Civics 101, teaching Pennsylvania politics and policy. Welcome back. Our next guest on the phone is Colonel Robert Ivanchik, Pennsylvania State Police Commissioner. Colonel Ivanchik, thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Glad to be here. So how is the state police enforcing Governor Wolf's order to suspend in-person operations of non-life sustaining businesses? Well, basically, uh, the state police is focused on educating uh, potentially non-compliant businesses, um, and we're working towards uh, achieving voluntary compliance. Uh, if we get a report of a non-compliant business, the first thing we do is have a conversation with the business owner. Uh, we found that in the vast majority of the cases, a conversation is sufficient to bring the businesses into compliance. Uh, you know, troopers are people, too. Uh, we're all in this together, and we understand it's a tough time for business owners right now. Uh, we're here to help, but and uh, not to get people unnecessarily involved in the legal system. Uh, with all that said, there are serious penalties for disregarding the governor's order. Uh, we can utilize the uh, Administrative Code of 1929 as well as the Pennsylvania's Disease Prevention and Control Act. Uh, however, to date, uh, we have not cited anyone. Uh, the compliance seems to be uh, voluntary, and it seems like people are really stepping up to, to the challenges ahead and doing what the right, the, the right things to do uh, for the right reasons. So how are you educating these business owners to help them with this voluntary uh, closure of their business? Uh, well, basically, uh, when we get a complaint, we'll send the trooper out to the uh, establishment that's in our jurisdiction. Uh, additionally, the local law enforcement agencies are also work working to that end as well. Um, there's a lot of information that's constantly evolving. Uh, we encourage people to report or sus uh, suspected non-compliant businesses. Uh, and what we do is uh, we go out and talk to them. Uh, they seem to be, you know, under the uh, uh, doing things for the good of the, the order of the people out there in the communities. And, uh, you know, we encourage them to uh, to comply voluntarily. Uh, we ask people not to call 911 to report non-compliant businesses. Uh, keep those lines open for actual life-threatening emergencies. So how should the public report non-compliant businesses? Uh, they should call their uh, local law enforcement agency, whether it's uh, a local law enforcement or whether it's PSP jurisdiction. Uh, you can call on our off offline numbers, uh, but again, we refer people not to call 911. And what have the reactions been to conversations with state troopers with these business owners? Uh, I think it's good. The feedback from the field is that it's been mostly positive, and I, I think it will continue in that way. Uh, you know, it seems like uh, we have more and more people being affected by this virus, and I think people are really, really stepping up and doing what's right. Now, do state police also have a role in enforcing Governor Wolf's stay-at-home order? Uh, we do, but uh, it's no additional law enforcement action, basically. Uh, again, if we come across someone in violation of the order, uh, he or she would, uh, we would treat it as an opportunity to educate the person uh, on the importance of staying home and basically trying to flatten the curve that, uh, you know, we hear talk about. Uh, it, you know, a stay-at-home order is not entered into lightly. It's uh, very serious, and it's important that people abide by it, irrespective of possible criminal penalties. Uh, this isn't really a law enforcement issue. It's a public health issue. It's a public health emergency, and we all need to do our part. And how else are you working with the governor's administration to help stop the spread of COVID-19? Well, uh, one of the things that we've done, we've established an internal incident management team. Uh, and what that does, it creates for us clear lines of communication. Uh, we also do internally a daily command briefing on the current status and instructions. Uh, we work hand in hand. We have people uh, situated over in Pima operations. Uh, we're trying to identify adequate and appropriate personnel protective equipment. Uh, we've given some out to our people, but, uh, you know, we're like some other agencies as well. We're on a waiting list to get some additional uh, equipment. Uh, we've tried to identify our key priorities, and uh, we continue with our uh, continue, continuation of opportunity and operations plans. Uh, we're trying to educate our personnel, basically, to, you know, this is a new health issue, and try and come up with the latest information so we can keep them safe. 
Uh, and again, we're trying to model desired behaviors, uh, you know, including social distancing when we can. Unfortunately, sometimes, you know, we are hands-on uh, entity uh, in law enforcement. Uh, so, uh, you know, but we're trying to do our best to social distance as well. How has the coronavirus affected your staffing and your operations with the state police? Uh, operations basically uh, is pretty much a normal course of business at this point in time. Uh, we have picked up some uh, local law enforcement uh, where we had to assume uh, investigations for those agencies because of they have a, an exposure. Uh, unfortunately, we do have one PS. P trooper who has tested positive. Uh, currently, that person is in self-isolation at home. Uh, however, uh, we continue to do what we need to do. Field operations uh, uh, continue in a normal fashion so far to date, uh, but we are assessing this daily as things change. Uh, we're adjusting how we do walk-in visitors to our stations. We have some signs posted out there. Uh, uh, people could read them at the door if they have symptoms of the virus. We ask them to call the station, and sometimes we will send someone out uh, to see them in the lobby uh, or in the parking area as well. Uh, but, you know, our doors are always open. We're here to help, help anyone in need 24-7, 365 days a year. Uh, we're trying to do some things uh, differently uh, at our work sites as well. We're trying to do some teleworking uh, where we can, when it's possible. Uh, we've tried to reduce the number of essential personnel uh, so they're not coming to our stations uh, so we can do some more social distancing. Uh, but uh, we also have put out call taker guides. Uh, so when somebody calls in for assistance, uh, we have specific questions we ask about uh, any potential exposure should the officers arrive at scene. Now, have you heard any concerns from your troopers or any of your other employees about the coronavirus uh, outbreak and concerns for their safety and their health? Well, we do have the contingency plans in place. Uh, we do uh, have a lot of information that we've been sharing with them. Uh, again, through our incident management team, uh, we get the latest information from the Department of Health, the CDC, uh, try to uh, teach them about the basics of, you know, sanitizing the vehicles, their equipment that they have, and, and those types of things as well. Colonel Robert Ivanchik, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Have a good day. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back right after this. The 19th Amendment gave women the constitutional right to vote. This year marks the centennial celebration of this historic achievement. PCN proudly commemorates 100 years of women's suffrage. We bring you programming focusing on the struggles and triumphs women faced fighting for the right to vote in Pennsylvania and throughout the nation. Go to PCNTV.com for information and video on demand. PCN, celebrating Pennsylvania. Our final guest on the phone is Chad Lassiter, Executive Director of the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Chad, thank you so much for your time today. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So can you tell us a little bit about the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission and what you do there? We're the top civil rights enforcing agency in the entire Commonwealth. Uh, we receive complaints as it relates to all forms of unlawful discrimination. Uh, we have regional offices in Philadelphia, Harrisburg, uh, uh, as well as uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, we're comprised of 11 uh, PHRC commissioners. We have a workforce of 84 dedicated individuals uh, dedicated to our mission, our vision of making sure that people can live, work free of unlawful discrimination. Uh, a lot of the complaints we get uh, come through with regards to people being discriminated against because of public accommodations, housing, uh, employment, education, commercial property, uh, disability. Uh, and we stand committed uh, to this governor and to the citizens of the Commonwealth and members of the state assembly to make sure that uh, we expose uh, the challenges that occur as it relates to all forms of unlawful discrimination. And since the start of the coronavirus outbreak, what has your commission seen from people across the state so far? Well, from a qualitative and quantitative standpoint, um, we're still tracking those numbers, just like uh, everyone are uh, presently are, are doing, uh, similar to the state police. What we do know um, across the state is that this has an economic impact, which has been devastating. Uh, the social impact and the psychological impact, 
as it relates to many of us being social beings and having to engage in social distancing, uh, there's an educational impact. Uh, but for us, uh, as we're looking at the coronavirus, it's also the virus of hate. We're seeing a lot of discrimination towards the Asian American Pacific Islander community uh, throughout the Commonwealth, but in particular in Philadelphia, which is the epic center of the Asian American Pacific Islander community. We're seeing the boycotting of restaurants. We're seeing the destruction of property, i.e. vandalism along the lines of graffiti. We're seeing a lot of xenophobia and a lot of misinformation as it relates to this virus. Uh, we've been partnering with our colleagues uh, with the state police as they have established a heritage affairs section. And this heritage affairs section is to deal with the consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic that leads people to engage in forms of xenophobic behavior, unlawful discrimination, the inability to want to rent to someone uh, because you're stereotyping them. And we'll talk a little more about those impacts in a minute. I do want to ask you about the, the economic and social impacts that this virus is having. How is it affecting people here in Pennsylvania? And what is your commission doing to help those people? Well, our commission is not directly responsible for helping the economic impact uh, one, from a standpoint of getting people back to, to working, because we know that the roles of uh, unemployment compensation are vast and they're growing. One of the things we do stand idly by to do is to make ourselves readily available for when individuals are discriminated against the workplace, uh, making sure that we are readily available to take complaints that come in. Uh, from a social standpoint, uh, our educational division, which um, is a member of two, we have a lot of opportunities to work in a collaborative and do coalition building with our advisory council. Our advisory councils are what we see as the individuals who are in various catchment areas, whether that be Hazleton, Lehigh County, Lancaster, Philadelphia, et cetera, et cetera. And our education division is working to ensure that various things occur where people are given information uh, from an educational standpoint. They know what COVID-19 is. Our legal division is putting a lot of uh, great high-level guidances in place uh, with regards to COVID-19, our operation side, uh, which our regional directors and our director of enforcement are making sure that their staff are, you know, triaging the cases, making sure that once again, we're readily available to deal with the impact that this has. The social impact that we see is that you see children having to be educated at homeschool. We understand that some people uh, like to be out in the community. The best thing that people can do at this particular point in time is to stay at home so that this can get squared away. Uh, but from a PHRC standpoint, is making sure that those employers don't discriminate against people, uh, that when people are discriminated against, they know that they can reach out to the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Well, now, when it comes to racial and lawful discrimination, what kind of calls has your commission been seeing? Our, call, our commission hasn't received any calls to date, um, but we've been working in conjunction with the Governor's Advisory Commission uh, for Asian American Pacific Islands and the state police. I would imagine we're going to start seeing an uptick uh, with regards to calls coming into us. Uh, we're going to also hear more about discrimination along the lines of you know, public accommodations, i.e. housing. Um, and so we're readily available for that. Uh, but as of today, um, we have not received any phone calls. Uh, but you can imagine that this is a fluid situation. This is a global pandemic. There are a lot of challenges um, in Pennsylvania. We understand that vulnerable populations oftentimes don't reach out. And that's why our partnership with the state police is very apropos and it's very encouraging to know that they were proactive in setting up their heritage affairs section, um, that if anyone feels as though that they've been discriminated against, they can call 1-800-4PA-TIPS, which in accurate is 1-800-472-8477. Now, how does your commission, along with partnerships with the state police, plan to address calls about discrimination here in the state? Well, our normal process is, you know, uh, taking the complaint over the phone, uh, looking for accuracy and making sure that we respond in the appropriate manner. Uh, it's not just the state police. It's making sure that people know that they can file a complaint with the PHRC um, and that knowing that PHRC 
with our processes and practices, we're enhancing them, that we're going to try to deal with everything that relates to not just COVID-19, but just ongoing aspects of discrimination. But I also have to say that these are challenging times. It's challenging times for our democracy. It's challenging times for the Commonwealth. Uh, we also, on a macro level, have experienced a Commonwealth hiring freeze. Uh, and so that means that it's not just PHRC, but it's all of the agencies in the Commonwealth. We're going to be required to do this work uh, and trying times. Well, when you look at the fact that LGBT discrimination and transphobia and all forms of unlawful discrimination does not take a break. We can't take a break as well. Uh, with our three offices being closed, I do want to note that our dedicated staff are at home engaged in teleworking. I also want to note that our mediation, uh, when you mediate the challenges between the complainant and the respondent, we're going to be enhancing that by possibly doing mediation through uh, virt virtual reality. And, and so those things are, are important. Our chief counsel, Delhi, is working on telework proposals, making sure that we continue to make the argument for how valuable the staff is. Uh, and during times like this, you have to review, you have to revise policies and procedures. You have to look at short-term intake reduction versus long-term intake processes and case investigative procedures. Uh, and it's one of the things that we often don't talk about in doing this work, which is resiliency. Uh, the staff is resilient. The Commonwealth is resilient. These agencies are resilient. This governor is resilient. And so you're doing all this against the virus of hate. When you have a president of the United States that's calling it the Chinese virus, uh, and now he's shifted gears, uh, and that's a good thing, but the damage has already been done. And so you have folks who are in our Asian American Pacific Islander communities who, for the most part, are afraid of some of the narratives that they hear. And so we have to also just lend an ear to them. We're working with State Rep. Patty Kim uh, and the state legislator. We're working with uh, Councilwoman Helen Jim down in Philadelphia and various other civic organizations to make sure that we address these forms of xenophobia. Now, you mentioned that during this time of coronavirus, there's really been this disease of hate. How can people here in Pennsylvania stop that spread of hate during such a difficult time for everybody? Well, I think each person has to look within themselves for their own moral compass and moral imperative of how they want to address that. Um, out and about. From a macro, micro, and meso level, you have the state police, you have the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission, you have the uh, auditor, uh, I'm sorry, you have the attorney general's office. But let's say, for instance, you're in the supermarket uh, and you see someone engaged in a form of mean-spiritedness, racism, xenophobic uh, 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 underpinnings. You may want to just go and get a store manager to deal with that. Um, other people may want to intervene and try to mediate the conflict. Uh, that may put you in harm's way. Uh, but the primary thing is, you know, to stand in solidarity with the Asian American Pacific Islander community and all communities. So if you saw last week or the week before last, uh, there was a lot of uh, transphobia towards Dr. Levine. Uh, we stand as the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission with Dr. Levine. We stand as allies um, and just good human beings with the trans community, with the LGBT community, with the Asian American Pacific Islander community. We also have to be aware of this notion of scapegoat hypothesis, because today is the Asian American Pacific Islander community. Tomorrow, it could be someone engaged in a, you know, hypothetical hypothesis that coronavirus was created by another demographic of ethnicity, race, and things of that nature. So I think it, it's not just education, but it's also people knowing that they have a recourse, and that recourse is the state police, that recourse is the attorney general's office, and that recourse is the Pennsylvania Human Relations Commission. Now, one final question. How can people keep themselves healthy and safe mentally, physically, emotionally during this time of coronavirus? Very profound question and much needed question. Two ways of coping. Uh, we mostly, most likely people will uh, cope uh, adaptively. We don't want people coping maladaptively. Adaptively, you can do your walking. Make sure you engage in social distancing. Uh, some people are people of faith. And we respect people also who are people of non-faith. So people can pray, people can chant, people can journal. Uh, you might want to use the greater enhancement of modern technology. Faith FaceTime your loved ones, not just because they're elderly, but also the children. 
uh, stay active with a regiment. Uh, I commute from Philadelphia to Harrisburg. I get up four o'clock every day because of the coronavirus. I'm here in Philadelphia. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I still get up every morning at four o'clock. Uh, what I do is I meditate. I'll eat a yogurt. I'll drink a bottle of water. I'll have a grapefruit and two eggs. And then I get started with some emails. Um, I make sure I go out uh, and I walk in my back lawn. I walk in my front lawn. I'll take a walk in my community. Um, I think that one of the things is we can also turn off the television. When we're looking at neuroscience and neurotransmitters, we don't always have to look at the news. Even though we're staying in, at home and we're sheltering in place, we can control two outcomes. We can control our mind and we can control our spirits. So we don't have to buy into the anxiety and the anxiousness that we see on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, BBC. This is a global pandemic, um, but we are resilient. And, you know, doomsday forecast, the world is not coming to an end. It's unfortunate that individuals um, are infected with this and individuals are, are going to die and individuals have died. I lost my great uncle, my, uncle, my great uncle Willie, Last Friday, he was 101 years of age. Uh, the week before he was in the hospital with pneumonia, he died last Friday of coronavirus. Um, and so it hits home, but it doesn't have to be a personal situation. We're all connected to this thing called humanity. And so when we look at what's going on in the world, it's a global pandemic. But when we look at it, we're a global people tied in. So something that happens in Italy, I'm concerned about. And I think one of the other ways that we can cope is to make sure that we stay in the moment, whatever that hobby is, try to engage in that hobby. It's also an opportunity for us to reset, recharge, and to reward ourselves. What are we rewarding ourselves for? We reward ourselves because every single day we get up. And as challenging as it is, hopefully we can get through this. Um, I think that people have an opportunity to level set with their families. They have an opportunity to level set with their community. And we have to be there for one another, whether that's, you know, donating food, online applications. We could do that with regards to sending money to organizations and nonprofits and NGOs that are helping people. Uh, we also have to be leery that people will suffer from anxiety disorder. Uh, they will have PTSD. Um, our recovery community. So we want to be able to be there for them as well. Chad Lassiter, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for having me. And the Commonwealth will get through this. And may everyone just stay at home and stay safe. I'm humbled to be on your show. You stay safe as well. Thank you. Thank you. And that is all the time for today's show. Coronavirus Impact airs on weekdays and at noon, weekdays at noon and 8 p.m., it's also available on PCN's Facebook page, YouTube channel, and on our website, PCNTV.com. I'm Kess Baker. Thank you for watching.